We also heard some caution that it's not quite ready for everything. There is still work that is happening. But at the same time, we also heard lots of interest about uh, projects going on, about stock exchanges embracing the technology, about uh, other pilots, um, about crowdfunding, and so on. So clearly, lots and lots and lots of interest. Also, just listening, it's the first time I've heard a non-computer scientist use Byzantine fault tolerance as, a, as an acronym in public. So that's definitely a new one that I think this technology has helped create. Uh, we heard uh, lawyers talk about catching bad guys using blockchain analytics. Uh, we heard um, venture capitalists talk about this is the most exciting thing. I'm not sure whether he said including the internet or since the internet, but one of those. And, uh, and Laura uh, talk about from a journalist perspective of the level of excitement, which I think is also a reflection on the community. So, so sort of putting it together, we are now going to explore quite a bit more on sort of what are these underpinnings that are being talked about. What is these technologies? What is the Hyperledger project that's been ref referenced quite a few times, and so on. So, so just a couple of uh, quick questions to start. So, Brian, you recently got appointed as the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation. So, uh, you, well, you clearly you elected uh, to take that position. Uh, would you just comment on why and uh, what gets you excited about doing that? Sure. So, uh, thanks. Um, so the Hyperledger project at the Linux Foundation was launched in December of last year uh, and had been um, launched after a set of conversations amongst uh, a, bun a bunch of key companies over what seemed to be something missing in the marketplace, which was a, uh, a set of technologies that could be focused on many of these back office functions related to uh, 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 blockchain technologies, but also the, the prospect of simply alternatives to the other major chains that are out there and kind of asking a question, you know, are these, are things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and others, are they potentially moonshots? And I'll use uh, the, the, uh, the spaceship metaphor that perhaps Matt didn't want to use, um, uh, when in reality what we need is to put a lot of satellites into low Earth orbit. Right, and to be talking about common technology stacks, common standards, but <clears throat> as we know, thanks to uh, how, how the internet was built, the best common standards are those that actually have open source underpinnings. Um, the Linux Foundation had done this successfully with the Linux ecosystem and the Linux kernel, uh, and as, as well started to progress into other adjacent spaces uh, over the last few years. Uh, the uh, Critical Infrastructure Initiative was one of their projects that emerged after the uh, Heartbleed bug was discovered and the realization that uh, OpenSSL was kind of going under-resourced, under undermanned, and so uh, Jim put together a coalition of companies to help provide some funding to solve that problem. Um, likewise with Automotive Linux, uh, likewise with the Cloud Native uh, 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 Federation, um, there's uh, uh, the Linux Foundation has kind of emerged as this consortium building machine uh, and uh, really also focused on how do we build not only a, a business constituency around these technologies, but also a technology constituency that taps into the best of the open source culture and the open source community. Um, I arrived at this uh, after having been a venture capitalist for the last two and a half years and seeing quite a number of Bitcoin and blockchain uh, companies come through, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, come, come and present, and saying to myself, you know, it, 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 I was a little bit worried that it felt like there was a lot of competition at the low levels of the, of the stack, that a lot of people were taking um, the open source code around Bitcoin or Ethereum and saying, and we'll, we'll just harden it, we'll make it, you know, commercial, proprietary, and then we'll be the gatekeeper for everyone. And that seemed to be in conflict with what actually made not only these technologies work well and become adopted, I think Bitcoin was adopted very widely, partly because the underlying technology was very broadly licensable, um, but also seemed to, to be at odds with, again, how the internet was built. And so I, I, I was not uh, lucky enough to be there on day one, uh, but I had been tracking the project and talking with Jim. Uh, I like to joke that Jim got an office at the Presidio as a recruiting tool uh, to get hire me, because that's where my last job was. Um, uh, but uh, uh, he and I talked, and I spent time immersing myself in this community and felt like, okay, this is really the right kind of project to, to get launched at this time. Uh, and it taps into back, uh, experience that I've had 
uh, in the open source community, including uh, being one of the founders of the Apache project 20 years ago. So that was a great analogy, Brian, that you just mentioned at the end. So the Apache web server did become that fabric for web serving, and I think we can now say web serving is kind of ubiquitous in the world. It's, it's become part of the infrastructure, <laughs> for sure, yeah. Um, so, so Joey, um, to introduce yourself to the audience and also to talk about it, as the director of the MIT Media Lab, uh, you guys have been pretty vocal about uh, blockchain and digital currencies and Bitcoin. Would you say a few words about what you're doing um, about these technologies and what do you think about them from your perspective? Yeah, and, uh, and I'll put a little historical context because actually I met Brian when we were um, both in the 90s. And I think I was just looking online. Exactly 20 years ago, I wrote a book called Digital Cash about how it was going to be the next big thing. And then it didn't happen. And, um, and then uh, I had been running a DigiCash server. I think you were running one back then. That was a big rage back in the 90s, digital oh, yeah. cash. And, and I worked on um, time stamping and hash chains and working with Estonian banks. And so for me, the, the sort of digital payments boom for me was in the 90s. And, and I started at the Media Lab five years ago. So it's pretty recent. And I was, I'd been doing other things. And... Um, and a couple of years ago, I, I kind of noticed that this Bitcoin thing was taking off. And, you know, it's called, I think it's called Mara's Law, which you overestimate the short term technical of, and then underestimate the long term. And I, I'd done it twice. Like, like VR was the third time, finally. It's like <laughs> real, right? So, so I was like, hey, okay, they're, they're back. And so I was sort of waking up my friends saying, hey, hey. And, and at MIT, we've got a lot of the pieces that you need for um, blockchain. We've got great cryptographers like Ron Rivest. We've got great economists like Simon Johnson. We've got distributed systems. We've got all kinds of the different pieces. And what's hard about blockchain, I think, and Bitcoin is that it's a Venn diagram of like computer science and um, just pure uh, uh, you know, um, formal proofs of security don't give you everything that you need to understand the vulnerabilities of, of, of distributed systems. But on the other hand, like you can see with the DAO, you really need to know how to write programming languages. Otherwise, you're going to create these bugs that, that you wouldn't make if, if you weren't sort of trying to write for a, a agile um, you know, sort of web developer community, which is sort of what I think the DAO was trying to do. And, and so, so there's a bunch of different pieces. So I, when I saw Bitcoin and blockchain taking off, I saw a couple of opportunities and some things that we thought we might fill. Um, one was there was a billion dollars of venture money, so it felt like everybody seems to think it's 97 in the internet, but it's actually like 89 or 90. There's no internet, there's no TCP IP. And so I think generally, I think a lot of the industry is over its skis. And having built the, well, been helped build and was the first CEO of the first commercial internet service provider in Japan. I remember back in the early days, it was really important, this relationship between the academics and the people who were just doing it because it's open source and it's great, and the government, and, 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 and we, we figured out the infrastructure. We had many years before we were piling lots of money and building castles on this thing. And I was worried a couple of things, that since there was so much money out there, I, I didn't see anybody who wasn't in some startup. And when we were doing the internet, a lot of the early guys, like Paul Vixie, who did Bind, and, I mean, there are a lot of people who were just doing it because they were nerds and they were hackers. And the other thing I noticed when I, was, when I got to MIT is David Clark, who created TCP, was instrumental in TCPIP, and now Tim Berners-Lee, all the people who do sort of open, like, the open protocols and standards. And we, we, a lot of those guys are at MIT, you know, and they don't have financial interest in this, and they don't make money. And on the West Coast here, you, you create the monopolies that then extract the money from these open standards. So <laughs> I, felt like, I felt like that part was like going full steam ahead, but the sort of non-commercial open standards conversation and governance piece hadn't been figured out. And it felt like that was maybe our role. Because MIT, and although we are entrepreneur, we're not like um, the Stanford folks. And we have a different vibe than Silicon Valley. And so, <laughs> so, I, so, so I actually did, I, I, I had a few investments in um, Bitcoin companies. I had some Bitcoin. I sold it all because I decided I wanted to be completely divested. Um, and it turns out it works. So when we go and talk to some central banks or, or emerging um, governments, they're kind of sick of being sold stuff. You know? So we're like, we kind of trust you because we know you're not trying to sell us anything and you're just trying to get it right. You know? And so, so now so some of this, I know there are companies and there are people in companies who are trying to do the right thing. So it's not fair to sort of write off everybody as if they're just trying to sell stuff. But, but, 
you know, I think there is a role for a, a, a community of people whose job it is. I mean, the, the government's one of them, but the government also has its own interests, right? So you've got, like, the Financial Stability Board of the central banks and, and, and certain types of people whose job it is is just to try to make the thing work. And so I felt like there wasn't enough energy in that. So, so we, when, when the Bitcoin um, Foundation, which was funding a couple of the key core developers, um, um, uh, started having issues. Um, I, we, I first tried to collect a fund um, to fund those um, core developers so that they could stay neutral and go to any academic institution. Um, for some reason, they all decided to come to MIT. So, 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 so we're, now, we're now funding the core developers, and we're funding, um, and, and we're not just on Bitcoin. So we're funding some of the core developers of Bitcoin. We have a lot of projects going on on Ethereum. We're also um, looking at different consensus processes. We're trying to work on sandboxes. We're working with um, some countries on trying to come up with remittance systems. Because MIT is really, and this is one of the problems that I have, is everybody sort of wants to know what my position on something is. Well, we, at MIT, we've got everybody from you know, um, Noam Chomsky to uh, Richard Stallman and, and, and everything in between. And so there is no sort of opinion of MIT. And I think we, we talked about whether Hyperledger should be distributed in, and should have a position. But I think right now it's kind of too early to know for sure what the right answer is. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do is to try to engage academics who probably weren't paying attention, to try to pay attention and participate and to do trials and to do, you know, and, and hack on things in, 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 in interesting ways. So I'm going to maybe extend on that a little bit and we'll come back to the whole open source and governance because I think that's a big and important part of this whole conversation, part of laying whether the foundation or the rails. But I think uh, just riffing off what Joey said, so there's a lot of reasonably hard technology that still has to get built. And when you look at that intersection to put it into capabilities, you need cryptographers, you need people who understand transactions. Uh, the word reversibility has been used a few times because that's required in order to, to satisfy both regulators but also the trust of consumers. Uh, you require it to be reasonably efficient so that you can do the hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Uh, you require it to be transparent so that people running the code can do it. And when you look at that intersection, I think bringing the academic community into it is essential because people may not always give credit, but a lot of the fundamental advances have been done on the basis of uh, fairly hard science. And a lot of those, I'll say maybe 50%, I'm sure the folks from both MIT and Stanford will claim higher numbers, <laughs> reside within academia. Uh, there's a few of them who do reside in industry. But I think that collaboration, I think, is going to be essential. And to let the folks have those hard debates uh, sitting around uh, tables and whiteboards, et cetera, right? I mean, just to mm -hmm. sort of play off that point. I think that that's an important uh, aspect of building out this technology. Now, Brian, coming back to the Hyperledger and you know, talking about building it out as open source. Open source is not just about technology that everybody can pick off. It's not about somebody trying to create a toll gate or uh, having that code in a, in a private company. And so the word open source also gets misused. I can say I have all the copyright to the code, but I'll let you look at it, and some people tend to call that open source. Um, they just do. Others uh, put it out with the correct license. But it's not just the license also. There's also the governance process that goes around how do you go about doing all this, who all can be included, et cetera. Right. And I think clearly, given both your background in the past and now, you're a pretty strong believer in those. So would you talk about the role of uh, sort of open source as defined maybe in the correct way uh, with respect to uh, blockchain and Hyperledger? Uh, so, you know, I, I take to heart very much the, uh, the principle in many of the healthiest open source uh, projects of community over code, right? That the most important thing to get right is a transparent, collaborative development process, a multi-stakeholder process um, where, you know, individuals may come for many different reasons, some because they are building a technology stack, they want to have support 2,000 transactions a second, others because they want to experiment with a new consensus mechanism. But you can, uh, if you have a project where you can put them in under the same roof and give them a way to pursue their independent agendas but collaborate uh, uh, as optimistically and as aggressively as, as possible, and you do that transparently, you do that with a common set of tools and a, and a common paradigm, the premise is that good code emerges as a natural byproduct. 
And you know, there are some critical mass questions. Do you have enough developers? Do you have enough momentum? But uh, that's, that's part of the engineering of a community that uh, uh, you know, there, <clears throat> maybe 20 years ago, there were a few people who innately understood this you know, and, it, and hadn't even articulated it. Now, 20 years later, uh, I'd say uh, you know, people have been through uh, the open source process enough and we've seen large uh, uh, projects emerge. And, and I think this is becoming a, a set of skills and a, if you want to call it even a muscle that a lot of the better developers out there, you know, they, they flex, they understand, they know how to do their work in the public. They know how to, how to encourage development of others and mentor and and those sorts of things. And that's, that's for me, that is the, the defining characteristic for what we're trying to do at Hyperledger is build a healthy community, perhaps even a community of communities organized around these principles, principles we inherit from the best of the other existing projects out there. Uh, and, and by bringing in technology projects and creating new ones internally, go and try to you know, spread this throughout the different uh, 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 blockchain technology stacks that are out there already, perhaps beyond our walls, uh, but also build a set of technologies that industry can depend upon uh, and very much involve that industry in the development of it so that people don't have to worry about the plumbing. You know? um, many of you have Linux in your pockets these days and you not, don't have to be a kernel developer because that's already solved. Right? Uh, many of you have you know, printers with embedded web servers in them and you don't have to worry about that and even the printer maker probably didn't have to worry about that because the technology was already answered. And so uh, um, the metaphor I love to use is there's a, anyone remember the film Brazil from the 80s? Um, <laughs> you know, for many people in the open source community, I think they identify with Harry, Harry Tuttle, he, heating engineer, who flew in like a ninja in the dark of night to repair your heating ducts because the bureaucracy could not do that for you. Um, uh, that's, that's what the better open source projects are built out of. You know, these developers who see it as their mission to try to get the plumbing right and build a, a broader infrastructure for everyone, not as some uneconomic kind of gift, but uh, because it helps them do their own job as well. So, so Brian, just give us a sense. So how many people, companies have already joined the Hyperledger project? And are there a few more who are still trying to get in and who have expressed interest? Give us a sense. Yeah, so we have uh, 50 different organizations that are members of the project. Um, uh, they include uh, IBM, Intel, DAH. Uh, they include banks such as JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. Uh, there are some partners that we haven't been able to announce yet that are in kind of the supply chain space and uh, in the medical space. So, you know, we're trying to build a really broad constituency. And uh, I, in, there's really kind of two, two halves of this community, if you will. There's kind of the business sponsoring half, which gives us the resources to go out and put this thing together. Uh, then there's the uh, technologists. Um, some of them come from those sponsoring organizations organizations. Some of them uh, are just independent developers who, who are drawn to the project. Whether you're a member or not, you can download the code, you can run it in production, you can modify it, you can report a bug, you can uh, join a mailing list, join a Slack channel, uh, subscribe to the GitHub issues, Firehose if you want to do that, uh, and be a part of the developer community, no matter where you are, no matter who you work for. Uh, and that's, that's the hallmark of an open, a successful open source project, is no barriers to, con to contribution and a really healthy kind of inbound pipeline of developer activity and interest. So, so, Joey, picking up on your comment on it's like 1989, hey, I'll debate you and say maybe it's 93, you know, just before Netscape got launched and kind of made it uh, the internet a household word. But, but more seriously, uh, you've talked a lot about that you need to build better decentralized trust architectures. Um, what do you say a bit more about that in terms of why you think that's so important? Um, and why it's got to get built on the right technologies, et cetera. Yeah, I, and, and let me riff a little bit off of, um, yeah. uh, of what, what Brian said, because Brian was talking about op open source communities. So there's open source, and what's key about the internet is the open standards, right? And they're, they're related, but different. And, um, and both of those require, as Brian said, communities, but communities require governance, right? And so, and what's interesting is, uh, it's, it's sort of sort of recursive, not in the way that that was recursive, but it's recursive. And it's recursive in, in, in that to have a lot of freedom and vibrant community, you actually have to have very strong rules. And similarly, you have to have very strong, robust protocols in order to have freedom in the application layer. And what I'm worried about right now is that we don't yet have even the 
governance structures to create the communities to create the software or the protocols. I think we're still in that formation phase. And, and, and if you, I think that you know, there are a lot of things that are different from the internet, but there are some similarities, right? So even when you look at, and you're from IBM, so I'll pick on IBM, but you, know, you have like, remember like Token Ring, and then there was like ATM. There were all these protocols that did things that looked kind of like the internet. And for one reason or another, they didn't survive. And for some reason, we ended up with Ethernet, which wasn't particularly necessarily the best, most intelligent thing. And, you know, you ended up with TCPIP, which wasn't necessarily the best, smartest, most important thing. But if you look at why they succeeded, it had a lot to do with the community, the simplicity, the ease, who was using it. There are a bunch of things that happened that allowed the Internet to start to lock in place, where, that you, where you had these explosions of creativity in between these sort of layers of, of protocols that were strict, relatively strict, and then you had open source, right? And so, but, but the evolution was interesting because you had like CompuServe and you had AOL at one point, which I, I kind of feel is kind of like Ethereum where you make a smaller community <laughs> who goes off and has more freedom and doesn't have to muck around with the IP guys, but then later disappears and go back to the IP. But, but we don't know exactly which metaphors are gonna happen, right? So, so to me, I think that, I mean, tactically, I think you kind of wanna start placing bets in different places, but you don't want to count on one thing. I do, though, think that one of the principles that worked really well on the internet is this um, principle of, of open source, but also, as you point out, is, is decentralization. I mean, the stuff on the internet that, that didn't work well, I was on the ICANN board for three years, so I know how well and it did and didn't work. Um, but the parts that didn't work were the parts that had to end up being centralized, and we had to argue with everybody over the namespace, right? And it was the decentralized parts that were able to flourish quite quickly. Now, again, we, we, we keep evolving, and mobile internet sort of kind of sucks, and so there's different things. But, but to me, I, I do think that sort of pushing to open, pushing to decentralize as much as possible to fulfill the needs of the DOJ, to fulfill the needs of the financial interest, but because you'll always tend to centralize because it's always going to feel more efficient. And so I do feel like it's the role of academia, the role of everybody to try to be as decentralized as possible because it, it, it opens things up and, it, and, it, and this, this decentralization of trust is really the, because I see a lot of people talking about blockchain but like a blockchain just for myself, or, or, or my Excel spreadsheet is kind of like a blockchain, isn't it? And I'm like, no, it's not really. You know, and, and so I think decentralization is one of the key words. Now, it doesn't have to be as decentralized as the current Bitcoin necessarily to be valuable, but decentralized, without decentralization, I don't think you really have that, um, that network effect and the scale that you're talking about. So, Joey, I think that, look, the decentralization, I think we'd all agree, is a critical part, because we talked about trust a lot in the first panel, and that trust is driven by the decentralization. So I think we should posit that if you don't have decentralization, then you might as well live in some other technology. Mm -hmm. And the moment you get to decentralization, then the next part that becomes essential is you got to have a way of achieving consensus. Consensus does not need to be proof, proof of work, as uh, Blythe and others pointed out. It can be done by simpler mechanisms. I think you got to talk about immutability, because without that, that trust vanishes. And... Uh, I would say that then you get into all of the aspects, at least where there are uh, enterprises and governments involved, and permission comes into, into being. So, so you got at least some principles that you got to worry about. I think a really important point about the battles you described, whether it's token ring, Ethernet, or you could go about uh, TCP, IP, and other alternatives. You can go on VHS, beta. There's, there's a long, long list of these uh, ones. I think you can say the one that was the more open, that had the much larger ecosystem, invariably won. I think the one that was done with more transparency and actual debate amongst technologists across industry and academia tended to win. And the one that uh, did pick some places, we actually did have to make a hard decision and say, this will be common for everyone. I mean, in the internet case, it was IP that was that layer, much below, much on top, and then a few other things. So I think there's a lot of lessons in there. Yes, uh, but uh, I'm, uh, it's le to me, blockchains are less of a networking technology than a database technology, right? We certainly had open source database systems that, that have carried quite a bit of market share, so to speak, like MySQL and Postgres. Uh, but, but, you know, the, market, the database marketplace is still very complicated, and part of that is there's very different categories of demand on the database market, and there really isn't a need to build one big database that holds everything in the world, right? Uh, likewise, with uh, uh, blockchain technologies, I think we're going to have many different public chains. I think we'll have many different private chains. Uh, 
And I think the permissioned and unpermissioned, meaning PBFT and proof of work, is even a different dimension of that. For example, you could imagine, and I, and I think this will be the case, every sovereign currency in the world at some point having a digital token that corresponds to that sovereign currency, yeah. which is a permission chain, the nodes on that chain being uh, the, the central banks or you know, some trusted set, but uh, so that they control the, the, the money supply, unlike, unlike with Bitcoin, but they'll be public because we'll be trading it publicly and, and, and all that. So figuring out how to make that work is a multi-decade kind of challenge for sure. Um, but I, I think it's more like kind of the database market and the diversity of options. Um, I think to really make us get there faster than we might otherwise, though, um, the more that we can share as much of the underlying technology as we can. And just standardized terminology, right? What do we mean when we talk about consensus mechanisms or smart contract vehicles uh, or, or security models, right? The closer that these communities can come to working together on these underlying bits, I think, the faster that we'll get there and the faster we'll get to uh, a decentralized internet that isn't just the cloud meaning somebody else's computer, but the cloud actually meaning a distributed platform. Rough consensus, running code, and common language. Right. And, and I think the biggest difference between the internet's rough consensus running code was you kind of could afford to screw it up a lot on the internet because you were just you could just yeah. sort of try again, right? But you don't try again with fifty million dollars worth of people's <laughs> money, right? So so I think that's the difference is you have it's it, it's it, it's 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 a, it's a slightly different level of intention and then to your point you can't roll back you know on the internet it was you could kind of sort of roll back you could just go to a backup you, but you can't go to a backup of a financial state you have agile programming over here and you have smart contract programming over yeah, here yeah and, and i think that and it I mean, might be hard to put I mean, we, we, and the, the previous panel talked a lot about the dao but but i but I, I do think it's important i think that the the programming language sensibility that's there right now is just a very much an internet sensibility and the way that that i mean because you're from IBM, you know, I mean, the, the, the kind of um, languages that you use for military applications or for banks is different. And I think that, that the, and this gets back to another point, I think, that we argue over the number, but I think the Venn diagram of people who understand security, distributed systems, consensus, cryptography, computer science, that can actually do the full stack is a very small number of people. And I still remember when I was setting up my ISP in Japan, there was only one guy who knew how to do BGP. And he would go to all the ISPs and program the Cisco routers. But, but, but there are probably only a handful in America. And, and it's sort of like that. I bet there are only a few people who could go and sit and really figure out how to write a proper scripting language for, for contracts. And, 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 they're not, and, and there are way too many startups. Just I, I don't want to pick, pick any names. But to, for all of them to really have their head around enough to really be doing some of what they're doing. I mean, it's just, and, and this is a part of surely education. Over time, it will grow, and I think it's great that everybody's excited about it. But I do feel like we're rushing forward, and, 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 I, and, and again, it's not just that, it's not just, I don't think it was, again, I'm not an expert in this, but when I look at some of the stuff that our guys have been writing, it's not that it was that the DAO was just a bug. It, the, the, I think the way they've designed the programming language fundamentally is kind of buggy. I mean, it, it, first of all, it shouldn't be allowed to be written that way. Yeah. And then when it fails, it shouldn't fail in a way that the person writing the code gets the money. It should fail backwards. And there's a bunch of things you can do. <laughs> um, right. There's a bit of defensive programming uh, mm -hmm. that you know, certain industries have developed, you know, and, and certainly uh, uh, learning to write secure software, you learn how to build guardrails into what you build. I mean, the DAO could have had, here's, here's a mechanism for reversing itself. Here's, you know, here's an upper limit to the amount of money that can be put under one contract, right, like this, you know, like <laughs> after 5 million, you know, or, or a certain number of and, Ether tokens. And not to just, mention the yeah. fact that they didn't really describe what it legally the in thing was, right? I mean, so there's, there's a code, but then there's the I'm law, right? <laughs> anyway. Not right. That. But there's lots of aspects. I mean, you're, you're touching on all the aspects, actually, of uh, having a definition on the standards. For example, the scripting language, you want to write down a description of what you wanted to do. There can be formal descriptions. You talked about guardrails, of what is, I'll say, experiential aspects built into things, which we know stop really bad things from happening. But there's also aspects which are pretty fundamental deep below, right? I mean, you talked about reversibility, or I'll use the word, you gotta have things like checkpointing and all that that can get built in that really lets you roll back as, uh, as financial entities have realized, for, I'll say 40 years or more, because those are the ways that you say, all right, at the end of the day, systems could fail. 
I don't say will, but good. Well, they and do. So they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and I want to distinguish between yeah. immutability, uh, well, reversibility and immutability. Right. right. Like, reversibility is simply an attribute of the, the systems and the participants that says, we made a mistake, let's do the opposite now and add to it, and hopefully they cancel each other right. out. But the immutability of a ledger has got to be a core part of it. Right? Absolutely. It's got to be, that history of that reversal is still in there. Yep. There is no right to be forgotten in, in a blockchain. That's right. right? Um, and, and, you know, that may dismay some people, but I think it's actually a tremendously good thing for those of us who are concerned about censorship, those of us who are concerned about uh, people covering their tracks and, and corruption and that sort of thing. And as much as I enjoy helping make Wall Street more efficient in my job, <laughs> what also really intrigues me and gets me up in the morning is thinking about the use of this as an anti-corruption tool in the deployment of, uh, uh, you know, like a, a land title registry, right? Or reforming other parts of the systems of the world where there's a, there's a common ledger that's needed, a common system of record, and being able to, to get away from this paradigm that the client-server model of the internet forced upon us, which is an un, unnatural ag aggregation of power typically into the hands of a central party in any network, right? Um, this is a chance to reform that at a fundamental layer, and that's, that's what gets me up on that. I agree, and I mean, corruption is one side. I mean, and while credit card processing may be the lowest, I think title insurance in the United States is not the lowest. That's one that you could go right. after with right. a blockchain well, provenance of title. It'll help, for sure. <laughs> well, that, that, that's where I think also the, the target of the app applications and the companies has been going after the stuff that everyone's uses like credit cards and payments, but if you just go after the stuff where there's a huge cost to trust, like trade finance and insurance and, you know, though, that, I mean, it's kind of like, why don't we go where the and money is? And they're not is? even necessarily, like, separated. Like, the Kimberly process for uh, tracing diamonds, for example, was mentioned in the last session, and this is the existing standard protocol for keeping track of diamond by diamond, and they all have a unique spectra. You can shine a light through them, and you get this, essentially, a QR code equivalent for each diamond. It tracks what mine it came from from who bought it, and then as it changes hands. This is a paper-based system today that um, there's a company called Everledger that is reforming this uh, to operate on a blockchain, right? And the brilliant thing about this is not only the efficiency it brings, but um, now anybody who owns a diamond can look at the history of provenance and understand what mine that came from and, and, and know that this is true, not just because a company said it is true or a government said it is true, but because collectively the network said that this is true. And that, that's great. So, so the only fear I have, though, is, um, and I can't remember who mentioned in the last panel, but, but is, is the... The, the, the human link, right? So making a super secure system with a weak human entry point is just making people trust something that you can't, right? Like I, I, I always fight against strong national IDs because people will use it for everything, but the cost to bribe the Both person the to get the issuance is always going to be fairly low. And so what you don't want is you don't want to centralize risk. And I, and I, and I do think that you know we have to fundamentally look at... Um, the, the, the legal system, the social systems, all the incentives. I mean, there's weird things that happen. If you make your phone encrypted and secure, I think I, I'm very much for end to end encryption, but, but you have to make sure that once you, the cost of breaking into a phone exceeds the cost of kidnapping the person in the country, that then you increase the physical security <laughs> too. No, because it's, 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 it's really an end-to-end -end solution with bodies, right? And so, so my fear about a lot of the land registry stuff too is that if you, because this was even before blockchain, I think in India I read a case where they made these electronic title registries and it actually increased the um, fraud. Uh, people fraud because, because only the people who could read and write would take advantage of it and they were able to lock in this, you know, and so, 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 so we, we need to be careful that, that just making the pipe secure doesn't feel well, like... You've got to watch the whole process, the, yeah. the legal uh, new regulations around it, you've got to think it through, mm -hmm. and you've got to think through the process, the physical process of how you do these things. And we have to be careful about magic thinking. So I was at a conference recently where, uh, uh, the World Economic Forum event in China, where every other session, you know, there was a statement of a major problem and the answer was blockchain, right? And, um, <laughs> and it's great that they're thinking about this stuff, but, uh, you know, one of my kind of pet examples is voting. Right? Um, there are people who say, well, if we just put our votes in a blockchain, we would do away with, with corruption, forgetting that the confidentiality of voting is an essential part, at least of American democracy. Even if we're filling out <clears throat> ballots and mailing it somewhere, there's still a presumption of confidentiality. Now, storing precinct-level data 
in a blockchain and aggregating up from that is a terrific idea because then we can see the link from local to, to global. But um, sometimes there's some magic thinking. Even if we were to have an, an, an anonymity protocol like David Chom gave us with Digicash, if people don't understand it, then they lose confidence in, their, in the process of the dem democracy. And so we have to, to guard against that. So uh, we'll ask a couple more questions on the panel, but uh, just to warn the room, we're going to get to Q&A right after that. So start thinking of your, of your questions. So two sort of uh, quick questions, and we'll go one by one. So when you look at some of the things, and you mentioned a few, uh, when you think of early experiments, prototypes, people beginning to use blockchain for real applications, uh, sort of today or in the next few months, which ones uh, would, uh, would you think are exciting? Maybe, Joey, we'll start with you and come to Brian. I mean, I, I, I already kind of mentioned it, but I, I think you know, logistics and trade finance, I mean, those are things where you have you don't have like a banking system that already kind of works. It's a very paper-based system, and, it, 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 and there's a huge cost to, to the trust, so that those would be the ones I would be looking at if I were in business. Right. Um, yeah, right. the diamond example is my favorite. I hope that we get the land title registry implemented and can start to figure out these uh, uh, parameters and the physics of such a system like that as it relates to corruption. Um, I think making supply chains visible uh, is an, an interesting premise, partly because so many of the actors in supply chains are so motivated to hide information from other parties, uh, and that makes it hard to do what like Nike wants to do, or they want traceability of their supply chain to, to fight um, uh, child labor, right? And and other kind of unsavory sourcing practices. And <clears throat> if they were to implement it as a Nike-centric database, that may work for them, but that make, may make it hard for them to actually get the rest of the industry to come on board to. So uh, uh, they're not working on a blockchain tech, as far as I understand yet. But, uh, uh, but that kind of... Our, uh, if they need to, they can talk uh, to If they need to, <laughs> yeah, just, um, I'll give them anyone from Nike here. So interesting observations. So let's go through these. Diamonds, human trafficking, supply chain, uh, shipping, logistics, what's common about all of these? These are hard, physical, tangible assets. They're actually not digital, and they're not currency. So when you think about the applications of blockchain, just, just sort of let your imagination go wide and not only confine it to the digital assets that we're all so used to seeing on the Internet. I think a challenge we have, though, is... so. With, with a web server, you can stand up a blog and you have something you can put your hands around, right? It is a lot harder to do that with blockchain technology. That's one thing that I think the public chains, Ethereum and Bitcoin, have really contributed to this is not only being a giant example of running these things at scale, but also being a micro example of how to make it relevant and users and get people's creative juices flowing and, and all of that. So it's been... And, and, and I will say, although I think that th that's where the blockchain business opportunities. I do think that the central banks thinking about and sort of threatening to maybe use the blockchain <laughs> will put some interesting pressure on commercial Absolutely. banks. I think Singapore talking about putting treasuries on the blockchain and imagining that you might be able to trade in that. Th these are important pressures to put onto, I, I know we talked about the ethics of the fin finance community and I, I get that, that we have the rules, but they definitely do, do need um, a little pressure right now. And, and also, I think the, a lot of the financial services agencies around the world are creating these sandboxes to play. And I think it's an opportunity, really, for... Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be teaching a class together with um, Zetrain and Harvard about, with, with tax lawyers and accountants and economists. And I do think there's an opportunity to really think about the whole economic system and the stability system and, 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 and re rethink this. So I, I, I think that the just digital cash is a store of value and betting on Bitcoin versus Ethereum, that's kind of you know, not that interesting. But I think rethinking bookkeeping, rethinking accounting, rethinking financial stability, re rethinking can we make derivatives more transparent. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting stability things that we might be able to solve. And it might reformat the role of the regulators, too. I mean, it's not to get too much into the earlier kind of topics, but um, whereas before the regulators were forced to play the role of chasing after the innovators, right, if instead you could look at the role of government as a convener, not where they have to be at the center of that market, but where they can be a peer, an observer on the market, um, that's, that's an interesting thing. You know, they could actually push things forward in a way that might even be hard for a single vendor to do um, and say and create a, a place where you could reform how a, a system... So works. regulator as enabler, not, not really policeman oh, government and Government as an enabler or, right. or yeah, um, something like that. Yeah. Then you toss AI in there and we're all set. <laughs> <laughs> So, so last quick question, and then we'll uh, go to audience questions. So just uh, a sentence or two, not long. Uh, 
So if you were to predict where this would go in five to 10 years, in that time frame, where do you think we'll be if we came back here five years from now or seven years from now? Uh, I think it'll be routinized, meaning um, it, you know, most companies will have deployed a chain somewhere. Um, we'll see in 10 years' time, uh, perhaps to, to couch my predictions, um, several uh, countries having issued now currencies backed with, with uh, as digital tokens backed with a chain of some sort. Uh, uh, but I think it'll almost become boring. You know, it'll go back to being an unsexy back office thing in a way. Um, but I, I, I hope it also increases the um, overall level of uh, trust that people have in digital systems because we've managed to build a database that can be a public of s system of records. So every company um, will have at least one blockchain network is what I'll take away from. They'll be a said. participant in yes. where they are participating. We'll be using in, it. in communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right. I, w I, was, I would sort of say basically the same thing. So the only thing that I would add as a possibility, but not necessarily a prediction, is either some form of machine learning or AI will emerge that will um, ch change the way in which this stuff might happen and it will change the way we think about laws and jurisdictions. The DAO, I think, I, I, I actually, I, I, wrote, I thought it was a bad idea before they crashed, just so you know. Um, but, um, but, but, but I think you that, the bug. But I think, though, that that is kind of where we're going. I just thought it was a too early, too sloppy. And I think once you start to create these machine-run organizations, there's some, some sort of out there doing things that are going to get difficult to regulate. We're going to be having to think about how, how these things are managed to the extent they can be. So I think that, and, 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 and you know, when you talk to the machine learning AI people, it's unpredictable because you have, you're pushing maybe t two dozen breakthroughs on two dozen fronts, and any of those breakthroughs could change a bunch of things. So, so I think that the, the role of machine learning in this is gonna be one piece. I think the other piece will be um, if a country does create a fiat currency or a central bank starts to issue currency, it's going to fundamentally change the role of commercial banking, which changes sort of the fundamental. I mean, you, you bring back the gold standard <laughs> economists. I mean, I think it's going to be an economist field day with different countries trying out new models of, of, of organizing the way they do things. And, and so, so that, that could be pretty interesting. And it might also give a role to some of the smaller, um, like, like, like UAE doesn't have tax right now. They're getting pressure from IMF to do tax. Well, maybe they could come up with, with a different kind of taxation with digital currency. So, so I think there's going to be some interesting innovations. In I think that's a great note for the panel to end on. So AI and blockchain, the two hottest terms that get talked about, may <laughs> converge or get used together. And economists Sorry. will have a field day. I mean, that's definitely a new one for the dismal science. So I think uh, with that, uh, we'll go to the audience. And I think you've got a lot to begin to ask. I think. Hi, thanks. Uh, great panel. Um, you, you mentioned uh, something earlier, uh, Joey mentioned something about smart contracts and, uh, uh, and verifying them. Um, so I'm interested in formal verification, uh, the process of um, making mathematical proofs that contracts can be correct. And I, I know it's made leaps in uh, recent years, but it's still used for very simple systems, simple state machines. Do you think it's come far enough where we're at a point where it's going to become practical to verify these smart contracts, or is it still a few years out? So this is actually one of the challenges that we're working on at, at um, MIT. We have a bunch of smart people who really love formal proofs. Um, some of the kids who founded the Bitcoin Club are very into formal proofs. So they're, tr they're trying. I think there are certain areas where we can definitely do it, and I think it's important to work on, and I think it's something that academia is, and maybe big companies that know about this, like IBM, yeah. should work on. I think so that, that's definitely an area. I do think, though, there's a lot of different layers of vulnerability that can't be formally proven. I mean, consensus is, for instance, one thing that's very difficult. You, you need to model it. So I think it's a combination of doing you know, r rigorous things like formal proofs together with um, sandboxes and modeling. And, 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 and what's great is we've got Bitcoin out there, which is actually running. And so I think the other piece which is important is to get more communication between people who understand really deep computer science with the kids out there that are actually deploying and know, know, know it. And I think that hasn't really bridged that well yet, I don't think. But just as a one proof point, a formal verification has been used for some secure systems, um, in this case built by IBM, that were deployed in both very large banks and with some very large central banks. And those, uh, while not necessarily talked a lot about in the literature, because not all of them want all of it exposed, because security tends to be one of these things that people don't really want to talk about a lot. 
but it has been done at reasonable scale. Maybe not at complete scale, but reasonable. I, I tend to be more skeptical. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a joke that in software, the last bug is fixed and the last user is dead. And uh, <laughs> uh, I've had to stop not make that joke when I was working in healthcare. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, um, software has defects. And I think what we will end up with with smart contracts is probably model contracts that, that become kind of a, a gold standard, right? Something that is battle-tested, has had many, many, many eyes, right? Not in an open SSL sense where people used it and took advantage of it, but where the PhD theses are written on it. You know, a model contract to describe a mortgage or a tranche of a collateralized debt obligation backed by mortgages, right? Um, uh, and that these will become standardized and thus more easily traded between organizations and understandable. And, right? and when exploited, more scalably exploited. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Uh, but, but also, hopefully, better defendable than um, something that's had three people look at it deeply. Right? Need both, I think. And built with guardrails. Next question. Do you see that there are any uh, underlying infrastructure advances that are going to be needed in order to enable blockchain? For example, if you look back at the Internet, 1993, 1994, everybody got on with 9,600 baud modems or 19,000 baud modems or whatever. You couldn't do anything like what you can do today on the Internet. It was only the wide availability of broadband that enabled a lot of what we see today. Is there something like that that you see is going to be required for blockchain? I have two. Um, I think one is we haven't figured out key management. And, um, and for you guys, I mean, most of you probably know, but like managing the passwords and the keys. And it's, it's confounded by the fact that we realize that we have no hardware security. There was an IEEE paper that many of you may have seen, but somebody was able to put uh, visually and electronically imperceivably small thing onto a chip that then they were later able to exploit to take over the machine. And we all knew this in theory, but the person showed that one person, not the whole factory, just one person could walk into a factory and, um, and plant this on a chip and then own you. And so then it, it's, we have to rethink hardware completely because if you can't trust your hardware, you can't trust anything really because you're still typing in your key and your move. So, so, so we're, we're, I think that the, 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 the hardware security we haven't figured out yet. I don't want to drag in another buzzword like Internet of Things, but, 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 <laughs> but, but I think it's hardware and then, and then it related to that, how do we do key management? I think those are two that we, I still don't see a good. I'd, I'd really like to see us have a different consensus mechanism than proof of work. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot of application for big anonymous public chains that are held back because there's people who are concerned about the environmental impact, concerned about the way that it accrues power to people who can buy a lot of ASICs and plant them at uh, dams in Western China, right? Um, and there's got to be something else. Maybe it's proof of identity in some way, but then that gets back to, you know, PKI being the technology of the future and always will be. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I agree with some of those, but at the same time, I'm my plate is full with <clears throat> examples and with organizations building things today that are simply an application of, of uh, you know, a distributed ledger, right, that, that can solve some real problems today. So I'm, I'm you know, I think that's a long-term picture that, that we'll get to. But uh, so much is possible with, with the, uh, um, the state of the world today. Only thing I would add is that when you look at both those things put together, if you ever imagine a world where ID credentials are carried electronically and could be provided by a blockchain, you're going to need both the things that Brian and Joey talked about for that to become real. Because if you've got your ID credentials there, well, it better be in hardware that is not corruptible easily. Mm -hmm. Nothing is impossible, but easily. And you better have consensus mechanisms that are public, not just permissioned, and scale. Yeah. So. You know, our physical ID systems are not incorruptible either. I kind of like the fact that somebody can't walk into a bank with uh, my driver's license and just because they look like me, try to um, empty my bank account, they, right? They can maybe do it. Oh, they can. <laughs> I'm actually going to say that is possible, actually, no, unfortunately. I, we, I, good ID systems are built in layers, right, yeah. and, and are, are multi-homed. And that'll be true for blockchain-based IDs as well. There'll be IDs issued by multiple providers. That's right. And it's the aggregate of them. The thing to worry about is when it's centralized on just everybody trusting one one single government ID for everything from, you know, 
uh, emptying your bank account down to leaving a comment on YouTube, you know, then that, that is where... Uh, I think we all actually agree on that one, that one centralized is not a good idea, not a good idea. Um, even if distributed via blockchain. Mm. <laughs> um, next question. Yeah, so my question was around interoperability of the multiple blockchains that we're seeing come up, uh, private and public, and this is more from a network effect perspective. What is the kind of work that's going on uh, in terms of building interoperability across these chains, keeping it uh, scalable and secure? I'll start. Um, well, we're, uh, we stole Joey away from a terrific W3C meeting on this topic uh, on, the, on the East Coast. Uh, right now, there are people meeting trying to ask, like, uh, what are the common elements between these different technologies that are worth standardizing now? Um, and there's a different range of opinions on that front. If you were to standardize any one of the existing technology stacks and the wire protocol between them and the virtual machine that, that they use, you may be jumping the gun significantly. All of them are experiencing major change in their infrastructure. You know, Ethereum is moving from proof of work to proof of stake, possibly moving at least. They're also looking at a completely different smart contract platform coming up. Uh, uh, and, and, and Bitcoin has its famous XT versus classic debate. It may be too early to talk about ISO or W3C anointing any one of those as a standard. Yet, we may want to talk about standards for things like the way that wallets and other end user information systems talk to a, a blockchain and a set of nodes on that chain so that it doesn't have to be intermediated by a, a proxy that is run by one company, right? Which reintroduces the potential for corruption or for that, that uh, signal being, being hampered by having to re-centralize all of our trust in one company. And to further my argument that it's 1996, I think it's still in the days before we have email that's standardized and we have different gateways and I think we'll come up with kludges and I think some of the theoretical work working on like the peg side chains, there's some ideas about how you might do it. And I think there are people testing different theories. So, so I, I think what we'll end up with is some types of interoperability being tested but that nothing, like I'm with Brian on this, I don't think we're, we're really close enough to anybody having their own thing locked in enough to spend significant resources and, in interoperability. And already people are essentially posting links from one chain to another. Yeah. The URL is still a magic thing, right? And a checksum is still, is in this case, uh, a magic thing as well that you can use to ensure the integrity of one chain by occasionally posting small bits of data into another chain. Right, so initially at the user level, you use the word or at maybe the data level, but not really, not at the fundamental lower levels of the chains, right. at least for the near future. Right. Um, Last question. Hey, uh, hi, Joe. Oh. Hi, Joey. It's Mike. Um, there, there's a new Apache project. I think it's called Milagro, which is about distributed trust authorities being used for identity and also for you know distributing the key issuance and key management. Um, it sounds like people are getting their act together in that area. Like the problem you just identified. It sounds like there's a there's a new Apache project that's going to do that. I don't know if you've heard about it or if you look, looked at distributed trust authorities. I've heard, but you I've, probably I've know heard of Milagro. I, I, is that, I, I, I can't even see in the light. Mike I, Shepard from um, Growth Point. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, um, there may be some people in the room who are involved with the project. Um, yeah, there, there are a, a, a lot of good projects, and I think open source projects are a good way to try to aggregate actors in a space who are working on similar solutions. And so uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, say, I, I, I was joking about it being the future and always will be. I apologize about <laughs> that was trite. Um, I hope it gets solved. Uh, uh, and, and yet, uh, a lot of people today still use PGP keys and signatures as the root of their trust in trusting the core developers on Bitcoin, for example. They PGP sign their releases. So um, there are good people doing uh, good work in this space. So I don't mean to uh, dismiss their, their efforts. But, but, it, but, it, but it is a hard problem. And just to get back, even if we do solve it, if you don't solve the hardware, it, become, it still is a little bit shaky. You mean most people here don't remember the 2048 bit key by heart? <laughs> I, I have so my that's the problem. My handle. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, guys, Joey, Brian, thank you guys thank you. tremendously. Great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Just one second. Before you leave, of course, we also have a speaker t shirt for you as well. Thank you very much to all of the speakers tonight. Thank we you. really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
A recording of this program will be available shortly on the Churchill Club YouTube channel, where you'll find recordings of most of our other programs as well. We hope you find that to be a useful resource. And you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Good night.